Hi, I'm Zach Childs, and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today, our guest is Pat Buchanan. Pat, welcome. Hey, Zach. Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure. So, so where are you from, and, and how did you start playing the guitar? Oh, gosh. Well, I grew up in Florida, in North Florida, you know, and it seemed like guitar was always around. My parents were musicians. My dad what? was a bass player, and my mom's a singer. And, you what know, kind of music did they play? They loved jazz. Jazz was the music in my household, you know. I had to find out about other forms of music later. What, what in the street? Of, yeah. Were they playing more, you know, kind of, uh, you know, dance band jazz? Trio or? jazz, you okay. know. My dad was a bass player, loved, you know, like Oscar Peterson style trio jazz. Okay. You know, uh, but there were Frank Sinatra records in the house. Uh, I remember Mr. Lucky by Henry Mancini, you know, Count Basie records, but mainly, you know, just simple. Trio jazz, it's kind of like graduated blues, not real hard or, you know, mm -hmm. complex. So, uh, so, so music was around the house? Yeah, and, sure. and, and there were there guitars around the house? Or did, yeah, there was a plastic guitar kicking around the house. And, I, I, you know, and, and then uh, one year uh, an electric guitar showed up at Christmas, you know. My brother got a snare drum and I got a guitar. What kind of electric gu guitar was remember, it? Well, I think it was a, a K or a Kent, mm -hmm. perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then, you know, I was always playing guitar and borrowing other kids' guitars on the block or whatever. Who, who were you emulating, you know, early on? Oh, the Beatles, uh, you know, were yeah. a big influence, obviously. The Beatles on Ed Sullivan, I was young, but did get to see that, you know. Yeah. You know, the Rolling Stones and all the British Invasion stuff. Who were some of the, guitar, the first guitar players where you actually tried to copy their licks? Um, just George Harrison, perhaps, or, yeah. you know, uh, Jeff Beck or, uh, with the Yardbirds or something. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> you know, just simple chords and playing songs, it seems like, you know, was the first kind of step. What was your first good guitar? Oh, uh, probably a Gibson acoustic, like, yeah. uh, you know. And what'd you play on? I can't, I just played chords, you know, and like, yeah. you know, <clears throat> D, C, and G. Yeah. And, yeah. then, and your first band? Oh gosh, my first band was, you know, we were early when my brother and I had a band called The Invaders or something. We were in well, that's a great in name. Fourth grade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Did you and, have business cards made up or t-shirts <laughs> or anything yeah, like we that? We had a, a bass drum logo, and I think somebody had to sit and hold the bass drum from rolling, actually, with their foot. <laughs> <laughs> you knew you'd made it when yeah. you had the logo on your, on your yeah, bass exactly. drum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, man. Cool. Good memories. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when did you, you know, start, you know, kind of getting more professional, you know? Oh, I was always in bands or trying to, trying to, you know, 
be in bands all through school. It seems like, you know, you'd be teaching somebody to play, borrowing gear and trying to cobble a band together, you know. And uh, then they'd go out for football or something and, you know, the band would break up and break my heart and I'd have to start again, you know. But What was yeah. your first good electric guitar? Oh, let's see, probably a Fender Stratocaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what kind of amp, and did you have any kind of pedals or anything at that point? You know, just played through amps, you know, just had like, seems like at one point early on we had a custom PA that everybody was going to play through. Yeah, the the tuck, <laughs> tuck and roll? Yeah. yeah. Gold Sparkle. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I had a Super Reverb, you know, that I had for the longest time. A lot of amps came and went. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what was your first, you know, professional gig? Well, you know, I kind of was always in bands trying to write songs and get record deals and stuff, and then, you know, would open for other bands and stuff like that, or trying to write songs and, and get a record deal that way. But actually, the frustration of not attaining that goal kind of led to, you know, becoming a sideman or trying my hand at that, you know. And so the first professional gig, I guess, that I fell into was actually playing guitar for Cameo. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Pretty crazy. So did you get to play on the records or, or did yeah, you? Yeah, I actually did get to play on the records, yeah, on, on the Word Up record, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that was, that was a big hit for them. Yeah, yeah I think it was, yeah. yeah. So, you, so how did you get the gig playing with Cameo? Well, I was in Atlanta and uh, newly married and, and my wife Danny was managing a Howard Johnson's hotel and I was like, you know, trying to play in a band and get a record deal. And at the same time, I stumbled into doing jingles, you know, as a session guitar player kind of thing. So someone that I did jingles with actually, you know, got me that gig, opened that door and it, that kind of worked out and that kind of opened this weird door of, you know, other sideman gigs. Okay. This is after trying to get a record deal you know, with a band and playing for a long time. So it just kind of opened, that, that kind of path all of a sudden branched off that career path and I just kind of wandered down it. So tell us about, you know, jingles. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, so, so you got into, so sure. how fulfilling or unfulfilling is it doing uh, jingle work? Well, it's all, you know, playing a guitar for a living is, right. you know, you just try to keep that in perspective. At least you're doing that and you're not digging a ditch. Yeah. So it's all good, you know. Yeah. But uh, it, it was interesting. It kind of taught you how to be a studio musician, you know. So you got some early experience yeah. in, the, in the studio. Sure, even though it was, you know, it wasn't, it was shorter pieces of music generally, you know. The, uh, any interesting, you know, jingles that you played on or anything that, that's still, you know, stuck in your uh, head? You know, a lot of regional jingles in the Atlanta area. This was in, in Atlanta, you know. And so, uh, gosh, you know, there's nothing that really sticks in my head, you know. It was a while ago. Yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy's Cadillacs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did all, all stuff like that. I was glad to do it, you know. So you, you toured with Cameo, and then yeah. there's, uh, you know, I've heard the story that, you know, about, you know, Miles Davis, you know, appearing, you know, with Cameo, yeah. and, and you getting to meet uh, Miles. Yeah, man, I'm amazing. I should have gotten a picture. I've never been good about, you know, getting a picture yeah. in certain moments, you know, but I got to show Miles Davis how to play a power chord. Wow. <laughs> he was in a Cameo video. Mm-hmm. It was interesting. And so, did, so he came over to you. So Miles comes over to yeah. you with his Miles voice, and did he? Yeah. With the, with the gla did he have the glasses I mean, on and yeah, everything? Yeah, he kind of was like Latter Day of Miles, how he looked then. And and he said, "My son's into these power chords. What is uh, what's that all about, man?" And I was like, "Well, put this finger here and this finger here. <laughs> Pretty wild." So touring with Cameo, what you know, what was your what was your rig at that point? You know, guitar oh, amps, pedals. I can't even remember. Uh, a pair, fairly basic rig, but I think I had <clears throat> a two amp rig. Okay, was and that to get like a clean and yes, and, 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 and a distorted, clean and a, you know, real crunch tone? Yeah, and uh, uh, <clears throat> in the same song. Yeah. So you could go from like a funky rhythm, exactly, you know, to the power chord or or a or crazy kind of whammy bar yeah, solo. Exactly. Kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. With, with with an A B switch. Yeah. <clears throat> Very nice. Yeah. I think it was a two amp rig. Yeah, and the first gig <clears throat> we ordered, uh, and the first gig, I, first time I ever been out of the country and everything, 
we were doing live TV in Scotland. <laughs> and I just remember some of the amps were different from what we ordered and everything was askew. And mm-hmm. my, my techs all spoke Scottish. I couldn't understand a word the guy was saying, but it all worked out. <laughs> so uh, what came after Cameo? Well, that kind of turned into an opportunity to play with Hall & Oates. Okay, well, how'd you you meet those guys? Uh, There was, actually, we were doing that aforementioned uh, cameo video. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, uh, Sammy Marandino, who I'd played with with cameo, was also working with Hall & Oates and said that they needed a whammy bar solo on a song. Okay. And I made up a fib and told him that I needed to go, you know, I think we were... We were on the road then, and that I made up, you know, a story and went and did the solo, and then missed the sound check in the next town, but made the gig, and then hurried to the airport, you know, and caught a plane. So with Hall and Oates, and then they called later and then got the gig. And so this was the period where they had just had a bunch of huge records. Yeah. And G.E. Smith had been playing with him. And G.E., I guess he started working with Dylan and doing the Saturday Night Live thing mm-hmm. where he was the, yeah. the band leader on that. And they had taken some time off, and then they had cut another record, and so you had overdubbed a solo on that. And so how did, you know, and then they called you back? They were doing a Japanese artist that I did that, that solo on. And then okay. they, they called me back and said, we're looking for a new guitar player. So I did the record and the tour. Yeah, and what album was that? That was called Ooh Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. And so, pretty wild. So, was there was there an audition, or was it just you played on the on the recording, and then they just asked you to play? It was kind of like that. Yeah, it wasn't really like a yeah. traditional know. audition scenario. Not like the Nashville Cattle Call, where they have a you know yeah. twelve guitar players show up <laughs> with their yeah. rigs and yeah, crazy. Yeah, it was a little more because uh, it was also recording as well as then being in the band and doing the tour. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. What are, you know, was, it, was it fun working with them? Yeah, it was definitely fun and playing all those songs. And some great songs. Yeah. Really great songs. But it was great, man. Any, uh, uh, any special you know, memories out on, out on the road you know, playing, with, uh, playing with them? Just playing to lots of people in uh, the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo was pretty wild. Yeah. You know, like 70,000 people or something crazy. And, and what was your rig you know, playing with Hall & Oates? I think I had a couple maces. Okay. Through Marshall cabinets or something. Yeah. <coughs> and any effects? There's just a few. I've always kept that fairly simple, you know. Yeah. Just probably a, a few things like a, a, you know, an OD box and a chorus. Yeah. I wasn't super big on effects then, you know. And what about guitars? Seems like I had a few guitars on that tour, yeah. I remember I had a Les Paul. I remember I had a Les Paul with a Floyd Rose in it, which was... <laughs> Probably something I wouldn't do now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but at the time. Yeah. 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 Couple strats. Yeah. So the Hall and Oates, uh, and you know what what uh, what was what was next after Hall and Oates? Uh, that kind of parlayed into a, a you know recording and touring with Cindy Lauper, which uh, was a great experience too. And uh, she went to Japan quite a bit. Still does. And uh, so that turned into. Uh, couple of tours and, well, several, and she, you know, kind of did that for a while, and then it was time to, you know, possibly think about moving to Nashville and establishing a, a session career and yeah. so, trying my hand at that. Yeah. So had you been, yeah. had you been living in, uh, in New York? Where, where had you in been a, living? I had like been the, living in Atlanta all those times in the 80s and stuff, and just working in New York. Okay. So, you know, I just kind of had a place there and, and spending time, splitting time between Atlanta and New York. Now, what, what made you want to move to Nashville as opposed to moving again to New York or Los Angeles? I always or? felt like I'd move to Nashville for, to, to be a session musician, you know. Okay. That, that would be something that I would eventually do. And, and the, so what year was this when you were thinking about moving to Nashville? Um, early 90s. Okay. And finally did around 90, late 93, 94. Now, at, at that point, historically, Nashville had been, you know, it wasn't still, you know, it wasn't you know, hay bales and, and you know, and, and yeah. telecasters, but there was still kind of a, a strong, uh, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, tradi- more traditional country sure. type uh, playing that was that was used. And I guess Dan Huff had moved back. And, and so, yeah. so it was... 
was that kind of the impetus where it's like you saw that the things were kind of opening up where there was a little bit more of the rock, you know, type I mean, of that guitar? actually, I guess, happened, you know, simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Uh, that wasn't such a, a big determining factor. I was just wanting to, you know, st- establish a studio career and get off the road a little bit, you know. Oh. You know. So, so you moved to Nashville. Yeah. And so what were, what were some of the first, you know, like a you know, recording accounts and, and oh, gosh, guys you were working with. There's a, there's a lot of them, you know. I was able to, to play on uh, Kim Ritchie's first record, which I loved. It was really a great record, still holds up. Oh, was that the one that Richard Bennett produced? Or yeah. Was it? Okay. Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. He's okay. really one of my favorite producers to work with. He's a fantastic, fantastic guitar player. Yes, he is. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome guy. Yeah. Huge, huge guru. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, just a lot of different stuff. Played on the Rodney Crowell records, and and there's a, there's a discography on AllMusic.com. Yes. So that's good. Someone takes the time to keep up with it all. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then you've you've continued to do session work. Yeah, I've been very fortunate to do that. Yeah, and then you've also done some some touring off and on. Yeah, and television and sure, and, uh, just a I've, little bit of everything. I remember seeing a clip of you playing uh, with the Dixie Chicks and James Taylor. Oh yeah, that was one of those CMT Crossroads right shows. Yeah. Had, you know, uh, an interesting pairing, yeah. Right, it was fun. So, so let's let's take that for example. So, you know, who who calls you to do that? Um, there was different people, you know, different like producers usually call you to put to do that. I can't remember who made that call. Because you weren't, I mean, you weren't touring with the Dixie Chicks or with or with right, James but, uh, Taylor, but it, uh-huh, were, I played on a Dixie Chicks record. Okay, you know, on their second record. Okay, so that's probably the connection there. Okay, I don't rightly remember. <laughs> so you exactly you, called. So uh, and you know, was was that the first time you'd gotten to play with James Taylor? Yeah, yeah, yeah that was a treat. Yeah, yeah, he was so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was he like to work with? Totally cool. Yeah. Just totally, uh, you know, gracious and happy to be there in the moment, you know. Like, doing this right now, this is what we're doing right now. It's kind of cool. Yeah. <clears throat> and he was kind of showing me this line on one of the tunes, you know, and it's kind of like turned into <laughs> a, a little master class with James Taylor. I was like, I can't believe this. This is awesome. What, what was the song that he was... Uh... Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. It was a cool song. That was one of his. But he was just showing you the, mm-hmm. the the guitar line that he wanted you to play. Yeah, yeah. That's what a trip. That that is a yeah, trip. He's quite a, a stylist. Yeah. So then you've kind of you've continued to do some you know uh, some of your own albums and you've continued to do some some gigs on your own yeah. and such you know through the, through the years and uh, and. I noticed a while back you had uh, Tom Bukovac playing with you. And, yeah, we uh, had a band with Tom and Greg Morrow and Allison Presswood, and that was my band. I have a couple records on CD, Baby. Yeah. And uh, I'm, you know, kind of a little bit up on blocks with that at the moment, yeah. just doing other things. And, but yeah, that's another facet of, you know, what I do. And, yeah, because that goes back to the beginning of you know you were you know kind of pushing you know as as a solo artist and then you kind of got into the side man and yeah. the session guy. Yeah, I always had that to do on on the side, you know, yeah. which was fun. Now you're being you're, a session person as the main main gig. Yeah, your uh, your work, you know, you recently I get well I guess you know, for a while you've been working with Amy Grant. How did you? Yeah. You know, now how did you start working with her? Oh, uh, man, just uh, through uh, association with Greg Morrow, and he called, and I think, you know, the position came open, you yeah. know, and as for a guitarist, and I've been there since 09, off and on, which is, which is wild. Yeah. But Amy's another great artist, and great person who's just very in the moment and very trusting of, you know, my interpretive abilities for the song. A great, great person to work for. Yeah. That's fantastic. Can't say enough great things about her. And then, you know, her husband, you know, Vince yeah. Gill. So, yeah. uh, you know, have you gotten to play with him some too? Actually, or? a couple years on the Christmas shows. They do Christmas shows at the Ryman with Amy and Vince. So I've been able to play with him. Yeah. <laughs> An amazing guitar player. Yeah. Just, he, just one of the greatest. Yeah. So, so it's been a real honor. 
Yeah, man. Been been on the road with Amy. And you continue to do uh, you know session work. Yeah. Yeah. What are what are some upcoming things that you're working on? Uh, I just got a call to do a new duo with Paul Worley called Aberdeen Green. I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be good. Uh, recently did you know a little while back did a solo record with Robin Zander. Oh wow! From the, uh, Cheap the, Trick, the singer from Cheap Trick. That was cool. Yeah. Did a cool record with Pam Tillis. Uh, recently that was good and, and just uh, so I'm excited about stuff you know just whatever comes down the line okay. <laughs> happy to do it well why don't we uh, take a break and come back sure. and uh, let's uh, let's talk about gear okay Yeah. Tell us about this guitar you have here. Uh, this is a guitar made by my great friend, Russ Paul. It's a Russ Paul Jr. And uh, he just took it upon himself to start making guitars. And this okay. one is a alder body and a rosewood neck, and he winds his own pickups. And this is just one that he, I kept after him to see if he'd sell me one, and finally did, it's kind of the first one that he, yeah, let go. He experimented with a bunch of different ones, and it's just wonderful. Really pingy, really resonant. Uh, just, no, you no. know, I love a black Strat, too. Come on. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's the best color for a Strat. So, Hendrix. now just for uh, for those that don't know, Russ Paul is a uh, is a session steel player yeah. here in Nashville. Yeah, exactly. And so he's played on tons and tons of yeah, records. I and play on the Nashville soundtrack with okay. Russ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, among other things, lots of other records, but we've, we've been doing those for the last couple seasons, and uh, that's where I kind of saw him a lot and, and said, and you know, he finally laid one on me and said, play it all weekend if you like it, take it. Well, <laughs> just to, to back up a little bit, you said you work on the Nashville soundtrack. Yeah, so, yeah for the Nashville TV show. Yeah, for show, the TV show. Last couple so seasons. Do you... Uh, Fantastic. And you've also appeared on the show a couple times, too. Actually, we did one live from the Bluebird. Okay. Yeah, but it was the Bluebird set, yes. which looked exactly like the Bluebird, which That's was a, a, a trip. <laughs> I bet. They exacted it. Yeah. So Crazy. Did, did they have you kind of, you know, because, you know, playing on the soundtracks, you're, you're backing up different yeah. artists. And so do they have you play in a certain mold this, or this anything? This was a, a live broadcast, this particular one. This okay. was the first show of last season, I believe, we did that. Okay. And it was just kind of a one-off, kind of a live. So we did two times, you know, like yeah. West Coast time was later, about 12 midnight, and we did it like at 9 and 12 midnight. Wow. Yeah, which, which is wild. Very Good experience, cool. though. Great songs. Yeah. Working with Buddy Miller, the producer on that show, great been a really cool musical experience. Very cool. And it garnered me a, a Russ Paul Strat. Yeah. 
I'll so when you had also said that it's it's wired a little different to where it's yeah. got a, it's got a blend. I think it's got a blend knob, uh, which will give you the bridge and the neck. Let me see, which is cool. Here's bridge. I keep it, I dial that in a little bit sometimes for a rhythm tone. It's got a master tone, and a Russ winds his own pickup, so they're, they're not real high output, which gives you the good, kind of clean, pingy sound, especially in the out of phase positions. So you didn't bring an amp today, and you're using uh, you yeah. know, our, our deluxe reverb, you know, kind of in-house amp. So sure, uh, that's fine. You know, I just thought, you know, that's totally cool. I do that a lot. You know, using backline or whatever. Yeah. So I guess you know, you know, a lot of you, know, you might be doing a fly date, and uh, you yeah. Know, so so what are some of the keys to to getting a you know a good sound out of an amp that you're just kind of thrown into a situation <laughs> with, and it's not your <laughs> luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I just try to keep a pedal board, uh, a fly pedal board, with uh, a good, you know, pedal on it that might you, you might leave on all the time, like the King of Tone, the clean side of it, and that's one way of doing it. Okay. But you know, just um, on fly dates and stuff, it is a little bit, you know, hit or miss with amps. Yeah. You also mentioned working in New York that uh, that. I guess you know, no one would carry an amp with them, and the studios had their own amps at yeah. that point? Yeah, when I first worked there, the studios did have their own amps. And wasn't, there wasn't really like a cartridge thing, you know, but, but yeah, so you know, you just plug in to have, bring a small pedal board and plug into what they had. Yeah. Which is the way, you know, you gotta be able to be ready to roll either way, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your pedal board. Okay. So now, is is this kind of a, a grab and go board? Is this what you tour with? What do you? What this do you is the this? grab and go kind of just uh, you know just do a quick gig board, um, you know, and it has uh, the SP compressor, which I really like. I keep kind of keep it on. It's kind of a keep on all the time with a mild amount of compression. Well, let's let's start you know from the cable. So the cable comes in, and what's the first thing your cable hits? Is it hitting the volume pedal? Cable hits the volume pedal, I believe, and okay. which has the tuner out. Yeah, and then you're going, so, you, know, you know. You have the, the and, poly tune, and then you, and mm -hmm. you're going straight from the the, uh, the volume pedal into the tuner? Into the compressor, I, mean, into the compressor. I believe. Yeah. Uh, and then into uh, one of my favorite. Show, show us what it sounds you like. Know. Okay, this is a, see that's without a compression, and that's, I, I like a, a fairly, just a little bit of a boost and a little bit of a smoothing out. Here's kind of where I have it set, both, both knobs at 12 o'clock. Then into the analog man, uh, King of Tone, which I have set for kind of a mild distortion. Mild overdrive, if you will. Get it up a little bit more. And then for leads, actually, you can kick this one in. This is uh, a little bit more overdriven. I like it in tandem. You can have them in tandem. Either or. And um, back. I also have a uh, an, an Arion stereo chorus that uh, that Barry at X, uh, XTS modded for me, which is uh, has a, a vi two. It has a vibrato setting. So 
I really like. Also has a chorus setting, so you can like set it to taste. That's vibrato. <laughs> I have a, a couple delays. The next delay I have in, in line is this uh, DD7, which uh, Barry at XTS also modded for me too. So what would it... Uh, to so put a on time in the top. Okay, so it's got the tap tempo is built in. He actually built in a tap tempo. Okay, for me, yeah. and on the Arion, just to uh, yeah. is that a true bypass switch? Or, it is or a what? true bypass switch okay. on it. Yeah, that's okay. the Arions are not really known for having a good buffer in there. So yeah, so he took it, and there's also a chorus too. Yeah. Yep, and he, so he put a true bypass and made it, made it quieter. And then I have this set for kind of dotted. Or dotted eighth notes. Into the Strymon Brigadier, which I have set for uh, just quarter notes at the moment. Sometimes I might get both going in time. And then um, lastly, uh, this Strymon Flint, which is a bit of verb. And it has a great <clears throat> tremolo on it. That's kind of that the phasey kind of tremolo yeah. that's in, the, that, in that some has, of the old brown fenders. That has a little pitch involved. Yes. And then this is regular. So I keep it. I got rotated between the two. I like that one. So that's kind of just the small grab and go board. There's a couple others. That's what I brought today. Cool. Well, let's yeah. let's take a break and let's uh, okay. let's let's pull out your other guitar. Okay. So Pat, what a beautiful uh, 335. Tell me about oh, this. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, this is a this is a 65, and uh, I love this guitar. Beautiful cherry. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. So. Anna. Uh, yeah. You were telling me earlier that this is kind of a, a transition guitar as far as the the neck on it. Yeah, I think this year, this is the medium width neck. So it's in between the nine. Yeah, so they went from one and eleven sixteenths, and right. then they went to one and nine sixteenths. But there's a yeah. few of them in mid sixty five that have yeah. one and five eighths, which is kind of like a Fender in the you second know, half yeah. of the year or something. Yeah, yeah. and this is the, the medium width I've gotten used to. Yeah. You know, but this is a great guitar. I got it on Craigslist actually, uh, but I really love this guitar. You got it on Craigslist yeah. here, here in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. And this guitar has been, I think it had Grovers on it at one point, so it, it, it's, there's, a, you know, this is a player. Yeah. Uh, they redid, re-veneered here, put in new tuners. It has a uh, Tone Pros bridge on it, which I really like. And Factory then, Bigsby. Yeah. So did you put the Bigsby on? No, it was on. Okay. Very nice. 
Nice. Otherwise, is it stock, stock pickups yep. and electronics? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Nice guitar. Let's. Sure, uh, I love this guitar. Well, you know, play it a little bit for us. Okay. We'll play the different pickups. Yeah, treble pickup. Bridge pickup. Here's a two. Great rhythm guitar. Here's pick up. A neck pick up actually. It's in a track really good too. I love it. So what kind of picks and strings do you use? I use D'Addario. What gauge? I use like regular 10s, those new uh, <clears throat> NYXLs. Yeah. I love those strings. So how are they different than uh, the regular they, uh, They're a newer material, I think, that's just designed to last longer. So do they feel different or do they no, sound they, different? They feel really, you know, the same. Okay. Um, I think they're, you know, some strings, or the coated strings or what have you, always felt a little funny to me. Yeah. But, uh, but the NYXLs are great. I can't say enough good things about them, and, and they last a lot longer. That, that's nice. Yeah, because none of us like to change strings. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your picks? I just use these uh, Dunlop uh, nylon guys, like the Flex 50s or something. This is a little bit, uh, this is a Planet Waves, I think. What gauge is it? It's like, it's kind of light at the moment. This one's like 50. Okay. You know, but it just it just depends on, you know, how often I'm playing. Sometimes I'll play a lighter pick just because it's easier on your hands. Yeah. Or just mediums are fine. Now, you know? do you tour with these guitars? Like when you, t when you work these, with These, actually, it just depends. These are actually more session guitars. Okay, so what do you tour with? Um, I have different guitars, you know. Um, uh, with Amy, I'm kind of fond of using this black Duesenberg that has a double B bender on it. Really? <clears throat> yeah. So, do you, so, what do you use the B bender for with Amy? Oh, uh, just in the middle of just little, you know, leads and stuff. Nothing really, you know, like super B bendery, you okay. know. But you're not playing, you know. Yeah. Old, you know, early yeah. Eagles stuff or, or Ricky Skaggs or something. Yeah, yeah, you know, but you can just take it and embellish on a lead or, or you know, add a, a, a nice cool note in, in, in an existing chord yeah. and a little more like that like Jimmy Page it a little bit more right. uh, and I have uh, a new Strat by a company called Vintage uh, that's really good that they sent me a guitar that I used on a, on a tour recently and uh, just depending you know those are the two touring guitars yeah. and sometimes I do rent one of these when you're doing a, like a yeah. fly date mm -hmm. yeah you tell them yeah, have a 335 for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you'd bring like the Duesenberg with you mm -hmm. and fly and with have that. that one. Yeah, yeah backlined. Yeah. yeah, exactly. What other vintage gear do you have? Oh man, I've got uh, I've got a few things. You know, I don't have like a crazy amount of vintage guitar like some guys here do. But I've I've seen you play another old uh, 335. Yeah, I do have a, a Ice T Burst 67 yeah. 335 that I've done a lot of records with, which I love too. Yeah. So, tonal, tonally, what's the difference between the '65 and the '67? Because you know they're 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 real similar. They both have uh, you know patent number pickups, and they're just this one's got a little bit more uh, brightness to it, possibly due to the Tone Pro's bridge. Okay. But they're both great. 
And when you when you uh, have a situation where you bring your own amp, what's what's one of your you know favorite amps to use? Well, I have a bunch of different amps. You know, just uh, I have a, a couple of grade sixty five amps, a couple of matchless DC thirty, um, a small box Marshall fifty watt that I've had for years. I love. If you were only going to bring one amp, what would it be? Hard to say. Two. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, uh, a deluxe can be a great desert island amp, you know. Just, it just depends on, on your application and how loud you're allow, you know, allowed to play. Sometimes you need to play soft, yeah. but sound loud, you know, like when you're playing live. And in the studio, you can play loud because your cabinet is in, a, in another room. You know? Playing, uh, I guess, you know, you know, again, you know the difference between playing live and playing in the studio. Sure. Uh, so, and and you mentioned volume. So, playing with an act like Hall and Oates and playing like sheds or stadiums and stuff, I would think that there wouldn't be really that much the, a great restriction on volume. But maybe playing with Amy Grant, who's you know yeah. more of a, a softer singer, that there would be more restrictions on volume. Is that true? Yeah, we usually put amps off stage uh, with okay. Amy and stuff, so it's not so much of an issue, you know. Okay, so you have you yeah. run them like behind the drum riser, or just exactly. completely off stage? Okay, exactly, or yeah. you know, either or. Yeah, and then you're running in your monitors. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's been a brave new world. Yeah. I just invested in some new ones, and I like them a lot. Yeah. So it's, it's been a hard, you know, transition from uh, wedges yeah. <clears throat> to uh, in ears. Not so much. I think from being a studio musician, you know, you're kind of... Used to headphones. In-ears are kind of similar to headphones. Right. You know. Well, Pat, I really appreciate you coming out and, uh, Man, and talking to Man, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Zach. Yes. Great. Enjoyed it. <laughs>